I'm going to talk about loyalty cohorts. So computational phenotyping is an important thing to do with your data once you have a cohort of a base cohort that you can work with. But I'm going to talk about how do you determine that base cohort. And that base cohort is, is an important thing not just in um, developing computational phenotypes, but in doing any kind of uh, research study using EHR data. Uh, and the reason being uh, data completeness. So, so patients uh, go to multiple healthcare systems for their healthcare. Uh, and we know this. So uh, the perfect thing to do would be to aggregate all the data together across healthcare systems or do record linkage across healthcare systems in order to get all of the patient's data. But in lieu of that, in practical world, when you're doing research and you're developing a cohort of patients, you want a cohort of patients who have gotten most of their care at your institution or one of the institutions that you have access to their data. And if you're missing that, that can cause bias in analytics, it can underestimate disease prevalence and treatment effects. And, um, and this, is, this is my visual example of that, but, but I think it, it's fairly straightforward. Like a person might go to health system A for specialty care and health system C for primary care and they were hospitalized once in health system B. And any one of those institutions, if they do a research study on that patient's data, won't have a perfect picture of what that patient's treatments and conditions are. So the, uh, the method of choosing a better cohort is not, not a term I coined by any means. There's been a lot, a lot of work on this over the years. This is called a loyalty cohort. It's a uh, set of patients that is likely to have higher data completeness. And there are many different ways of determining your more complete data set, and one is like, Griffin was showing just patients that have had three visits over the last three years or something like that. Um, there was some work done by a researcher named Josh Lin who validated at two sites a, a regression model using 20 proxy variables that predict uh, whether a patient is loyal to the healthcare system that are focused on healthcare utilization and primary care metrics. And so we implemented this tool as a SQL script that runs on your I2P2 data warehouse. And it runs in any site that uses an ACT. It is not strictly tied to an ACT because it has a table of paths associated with these features, and those paths can be modified for any ontology. But the default one we ship is for the an ACT ontology. So you could uh, go to this GitHub, it's actually part of the ITV2 digital twin package now, and I did not put that link on here, but I have that link later on in the slides. So these are the 20 proxy measures at a conceptual level that were used to predict loyalty. And the ones that are not in boldface tend to be things about utilization. Did the patient have an ED visit? Did they have um, medications in their record? Did they have outpatient encounters? Things like that. Uh, the ones in bold are considered routine care measurements. So things that you might get these things if you see a primary care doctor within that institution, like a, like a vaccine for, uh, for the flu or for pneumococcal or uh, blood tests for uh, blood in your stool, things like that. So these are things that at a certain age and a certain gender, many of these people will get these things. So, um, so overall, the majority of adult patients who are getting primary care in an institution have one or two of these things. And so that gives them a higher loyalty score. And if they have primary care at the institution, then at least there's probably some record of what the patient's conditions are because you're supposed to tell your primary care doctor all the things going on with you. Uh, so those 20 variables expand out into 418 codes. And through a series of paths, I think maybe 50 paths in the, in the ENACT ontology. And um, all of this can be found uh, in the appendix of the paper and also in the uh, code itself. And the way it works is this beautiful diagram that Michelle made. Um, patients are scored with some kind of loyalty score. So for each factor that they have in their record within a certain time frame, they're given a, uh, 
an addition to their score, a regression coefficient. And at the end of that, each patient is given a loyalty score. And then you can use statistical methods to choose a loyalty cohort that gives you a reasonable threshold of loyalty. Um, we wrote a paper on this. I don't know how many of people here are interested in academic papers, but I, I did put in one slide about it. Um, so using two years of data at three sites, we, um, we applied our method and computed loyalty scores. And then we evaluated it based on whether a patient returned to the healthcare system within one year. So that doesn't necessarily say that they get most of their care necessarily from the healthcare institution, but they at least are coming back to the healthcare institution. So it's at least a, um, a measure of the, uh, sorry, sensitivity or specificity, I get these confused, but it's a, it, it's a pretty good first pass. And we had an average performance with an AUC of 0.77, which may seem a little low if you're trying to like predict the disease, but if you're simply trying to find patients with more complete data, it's, it's really pretty good because not every single patient needs to have more complete data. Um, and then we, we added a component where the coefficients of regression were retrained at the local site and it raised the AAC slightly, um, not dramatically, but slightly. And it, it tended to cut cohorts by about 50%. So the 1,000 diabetic patients in your I2B2 query you found that maybe 500 of them actually good candidates for your research question. Um, and these are some of the regression uh, coefficients. So a little bit about the tool that is available for download. Um, and this, this logo was generated by ChatGPT and it seems to have perhaps symbolic religious overtones. It's not intentional. But, <laughs> but, um, but Take, take it for what it is. Uh, so you, you define a cohort of patients that you're interested in computing the loyalty score on. The cohort can be everyone. Recommended not to do pediatric patients because the algorithm was validated on 18 plus. So you can choose all the patients in your ITB2 if you want. You choose a look back period. So how many years back do you use to compute whether the patient has been loyal? And um, we experimented with a number of different thresholds and found that two years is pretty good. If you start going back further, then you get a lot of flags for healthcare that happened a long time ago. The patient might no longer be using the healthcare system. But if you do just one year, then people skip primary care appointments for their annual checkup, and you don't you don't get enough you don't get enough signal if you just do one year. Um, and then you can uh, choose what output you want. And you, you get results in these three tables. You get a loyalty result, but you also, as a bonus, get a Charleston, uh, Charleston score and Charleston comorbidity flags, and, and there's also a summary table. So this doubles as a way of computing Charleston index on your, on your patients. Um, this is a summary of the actual program execution. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it up for a minute for those that want to read through it. The key points are that it's adult patients, 18 plus, it computes the 20 bin binary variables and it gives them a score. It also uses a one year look back to compute Charleston score and assigns Charleston weights and determines the 10 year survival probability too. Uh, the, for, the, for those who are interested in what the table data actually looks like, you get patient level data on all of the flags in the score. So th this is the output table. It is, you know, there's a specific a cohort name assigned for that cohort, the, the patient number, and, and the index date at which loyalty was computed. And then you get all of the flags, whether they had that, that flag in their data in that time period, and then a predicted score at the end. Um, and the uh, Charleston table is somewhat similar. It has flags for all of the comorbidities that are measured in the Charleston index and then the actual uh, index and 10-year survival probability. And um, all, of the, all of the things in the tool uh, are configurable, right? So you can uh, change the paths to focus on a different ontology or add local paths if you have added different portions of the tree. You can change the coding 
that is um, used by the Charleston algorithm. Uh, you can also, if you do retrain your coefficients uh, using some of the R code that we wrote for that, then you can insert new coefficients into the coefficient table and uh, try out your retrained loyalty score. So this and all of the computational phenotype things that Griffin talked about are available in the digital twin package. Um, and that is available at this address on the wiki and that address in the GitHub. Uh, in the new release currently, you go to the release notes and there's a link at the top that says, click here for more on the digital twin. Um, I'm thinking to make it a little more prominent, I'll put a link on the homepage. Maybe I'll do that today so that people can find it more easily. Um, okay, those are all my slides. So thanks, I'll take questions too. Do we have questions? For, uh, actually, I think you can use that microphone there if you just flip the switch and turn it on if it's not already. Hey, Jeff. So, um, probably a dumb question. What does the 0.77 and 0.81 score mean? Does that mean that you're seventy seven percent certain that patient is a uh, is a uh, belong to the royal cohort It means that it's in seventy seven percent of uh, models that use that prediction algorithm, you can predict the loyalty score so it, it this, I used to be able to do this by heart. <laughs> But, but it's been some time. So, so you, if you have an AUC that's higher, then that means that overall the ability to create a model and pick a threshold um, is better. But uh, the AUC is measuring the performance across all of the possible thresholds that you can pick. So loyalty scores above 0.7, above 1.8, and things like that. So the AUC is measuring how many uh, uh, how well the threshold, is, how well one is able to find a threshold that works. You mentioned uh, that you're measuring the effectiveness of the score by looking at how if the patient is coming back to the healthcare system over the next one year or so, right? Um, but it's not like a great uh, way to represent, obviously, the effectiveness of loyalty, that how loyal is the system to this particular patient, right? So I'm curious if you've explored other metrics such as maybe the effectiveness of treatments provided to these patients by these systems and how that kind of analysis leads to maybe better understanding of the loyalty. Interesting. Yeah, the, the measure, metric we use to test for loyalty is kind of a minimum requirement for loyalty, right? If you don't go back to the healthcare system, then you're not loyal. That doesn't necessarily mean you're loyal just because you go back. So that that is a limitation that is of the, uh, the situation. And the, the best thing we could do is if we knew what we didn't know, which was how many patients are actually loyal and we could tag those patients and have a gold standard. But we don't actually have that. So people have suggested various things that we could do to improve this. Um, one was, that I've heard is uh, tagging whether, if we know the patient's primary care doctor is in the system, they're pretty likely to be loyal to the system. So we could evaluate against that. Um, you're suggesting evaluating based on effectiveness, which um, I think is very interesting. I'm not quite sure how to operationalize it. And maybe we can talk about it more and you can give me some more details on your thoughts. Other questions for Jeff? Oh. Thank you. Um, 
So um, once you associate um, a coefficient to these patients from the uh, loyalty cohort, you can um, generate facts for them for that for a for that uh, phenotype, right? So how often do you think these facts could get updated? Um, so you're, you're asking about generating facts, like facts with their loyalty score? That... With the, uh, you know, with the phenotype code, basically. Oh, oh okay. So in general with the pipeline, yeah, yeah, that... how often should you rerun the... Like, how do you envision, you know, mm -hmm. this, how often can one update these uh, phenotype facts in general, so... I'll give an answer and then I'll see if Griffin has a better answer. Um, I feel like you would want to capture new information if you suspect a patient's condition has changed and how frequently does a patient's condition change? Well, in any individual patient, it could change overnight. So running, rerunning it frequently would give you the highest um, accuracy. But also, we don't refresh our data warehouses every night because it's computationally expensive. So I think realistically, maybe you would run, run it every few months, but mm -hmm. Griffin, do you have thoughts? You know, it's, it's a good question because it talks about the tuning of this algorithm and how, um, you know, you can change the parameters and affect the results quite a bit. So if, we, in, if you're just using this to find if you're not running the computational phenotype pipeline, this loyalty cohort algorithm is really important to figure out you know, which patients have a code or which patients do not have a condition. We've used this before where you're looking for patients who do not have diabetes, for example. So it's not that they don't have a code, it's that they're in the loyalty cohort without the code, and then they're more likely to not have that um, disease. The computational phenotype, the algorithms for creating the phenotypes include weights for healthcare utilization. It's very similar to what the loyalty cohort is doing. So the, the phenotyping algorithm is less dependent on the exact um, kind of base cohort that you're generating. And um, our statistician recommends, you can just use that simple, I want three visits. And that might be a good enough for the use case of developing the phenotypes. Because you don't have to worry so much about tuning that. It's kind of a simple definition. Um, but that's a base cohort just for that phenotype generation. Creating a more general type of loyalty cohort, you know, the method you're showing is um, probably better here, but it does require looking at your data and tuning it and figuring out how often things are changing and what biases you're introducing and what subset of patients you're pulling in. Um, through a separate project I have, Michelle, we had uh, a different algorithm for loyalty cohorts, which uses different variables that feed into it, but gives similar kinds of results, but just kind of illustrates the complexity of this. And I don't think we've really solved the problem yet of um, you know, what's the, who are the actual patients who have complete data at your institution, or even only understanding what complete data means versus good enough data. So that's a, it's a good question, but um, it just show, it illustrates how hard this problem is. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using for the phenotyping pipeline at my institution a very simple base cohort, def, base cohort definition, which is just three visits since 2010. And that seems to work really well with um, the, when you're creating a phenotype. But if you're using that loyalty cohort for other things, like just give me some patients who have complete data and you're forgetting about the other stuff, that method is not going to work well. This does better than that, um, but then this works well for adult populations, but doesn't work for pediatrics. So, you know, you have to kind of match your base cohort method with what you're trying to do with it. Um, you don't have to create a different base cohort for every phenotype, and what I'm doing for the thousand phenotypes is one base cohort, but I'm using a very simple definition because then the subsequent analysis for the phenotypes incorporates many of the same things that would be included in the uh, Jeff Slow's a cohort description. I think we have time for one more question, if there's one in the room. Oh. 
thank you, uh, Jeff. Can you highlight uh, how people can take your implementation and implement for their project or for their institution? Yeah. Um, you can go to this, this URL. Probably, if I click on it, it probably won't pull it up. No. But uh, the package is a quick download. You run an ant script. It installs it, it's stored procedures in your I2B2. There's documentation on how to run it against your cohort. Um, if you don't have the Enact ontologies on st installed, you will have to install those or modify the paths that it's looking for. But it uh, it, it, it shouldn't be a heavy lift. I, I, I know that, that Hussein has had several sites run it. I, I don't know, has it been, has it been a, a, a large lift for them? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is R code if you want to work on retraining your coefficients, but that's not part of the main pipeline. The main pipeline is just running a stored procedure on your data. Does it add any attribute in the I2B2 table to keep track of that which patient is loyal? So currently, in, the, in this release of the package, it is creating, let's see if I can show the slide again. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. It, it, it's creating three, three tables um, in your I2B2, the DT loyalty result, DT loyalty Charleston, DT loyalty summary. And that fo is following this paradigm of we're adding these DT underscore tables for these digital twin tables. It is something that's on my radar to uh, insert facts into a fact table so you can do I2B2 queries against patients that have a certain loyalty score. I don't think that'll take a lot of work, but no. I haven't yeah. gotten around. I mean, it, it should yet. be, well, it could be as simple as having a flag in the, in the demographic table. Right, right. yeah. Um, that based on that algorithm, yeah. that yeah. it is loyal. Now, we may have to use a different term than loyal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because from either perspective, when they search in I2B2, they may not understand what does this loyal mean. Right. So maybe a better term from user perspective could be useful. Yeah, yeah. We've talked. We've talked about it in terms of uh, data completeness, and um, yeah, so we struggle with that term. But. I should say. So we've you tried lots of different terms. And loyal is the only one that seems to actually um, stick with people, and they'll kind of understand what we mean. Otherwise, it gets very complex to, to kind of, I don't know, just from having had to explain this concept many, many times, um, I always kind of always end up falling back on, yes, it's just the loyal patients to the system. And they're like, oh, I see, OK. It's not exactly right. But. So the Jeff's package for the loyalty cohort just populates those tables. It doesn't put anything into I2B2. The second package, which does the kessler comet algorithms, that does add stuff into the ontology, and it creates a concept called base cohort. And then the code, it puts a fact in the fact table called base cohort for those patients. Um, and the default in the kessler comet algorithm is that base cohort will be defined as the patients with three or more visits, but there's a part in the code that's commented out where you could swap that out and pull it, the list of patients from the uh, loyalty cohort table, and then that would be loaded in as what's called a base cohort. So in base terminology, the base cohort is we're calling kind of the starting point for the phenotype algorithms, but that's equivalent to um, loyalty cohort in that context. All right, uh, thanks. I think we should probably transition to our next speakers if we can. So can we have a round of applause then for Jeff and Griffin? Thanks so much.